Hey everybody, this is Tony, and I'm here today with a special guest, none other than actress, comedian, and all around a uh, 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 woman who do it all, basically, uh, Miss Phyllis Yvonne Stickney. How are you doing today? I am excited and grateful. Thank you. How are you today? I'm doing just fine. I'm even better now that I'm talking to you. <laughs> you know, the same. We had that moment. We had we had that shared moment of wondering. Are we going to connect in cyberspace today? Exactly. <laughs> I'm grateful to the universe exactly. for making it happen. Yes, absolutely. And I'm grateful as well. Um, now, of course, Ms. Stickney, you have a career that spans over 25 years now at this point. Um, you know, and you, you still are only 25, so you're making it work. <laughs> um, you of course... Of course, people seeing you in films like What's Love Got to Do With It, Malcolm X, The Women of Brewster Place, uh, New Jack City, one of my favorites, of course. Um, and I know that you started out uh, behind the camera before you were ever in front of the camera. So tell me a little bit about that and how you got your start in the industry. Well, thank you for doing your research. I actually uh, was able to attend the Institute of New Cinema Artists, which is INCA, uh, the acronym. Okay. And it was a um, um, film and television industry training program. Mm -hmm. So I actually learned how to produce film and television. It was a, a program that was started by Cliff Frazier, uh, who we send our prayers out to Mr. Frazier, uh, prayers and prayers and deep prayers. He's had some health challenges, but he had a vision. He and Ozzy Davis was our, the chairman of the board. And so through that program, I learned how to direct film, television, how to produce film, television, how to get uh, white balance the camera, how to get sound to the studio floor, how to do all of those things. But more importantly, how to respect the production and learn that the team, it was a team effort. And so right. like theater, a team effort. So that was really the beginning. So I went to New York uh, to study at Inca and then mm -hmm. I started working in theater. So I really wanted to learn how to work with actors because I was more interested in directing and producing, not thinking that they would want this little chocolate baby on camera. <laughs> but, uh, as fate would have it, I did learn um, production and eventually uh, made it in front of the camera. Uh, had some wonderful uh, uh, teachers. Uh, Cliff Frazier, as I said, was the was the director of the program. Ozzy was the person that was the spearhead, if you will, and was that uh, that that brought the 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 grounding and the funding. Oftentimes, because we were actually paid a stipend to go to school to learn. So Ooh. I checked one of the universities where I was paying and went, <laughs> uh, went to, to an institute where I was paid to learn. And from that, that was my stepping stone into uh, production and learning that I know the cameraman's name, I know the gaffer's name, I know the best boy's name, I know everybody's name, I know the caterer, because everybody, all of those 800 line items on a film budget are important to making you look good or making the lights happen, if the costumes look right. It all... Uh, uh, everybody plays a role. So I learned humility um, because I know it's not just about me as the talent. Right, right. Of course. And you know what? I, I really want people to understand um, and hopefully they can get a little bit of this out of this interview or conversation. I, I don't call it interview. Um, but you have a very rich history yourself. And, and just talking about being influenced and working around somebody like Ozzy Davis, uh, who is an industry great, uh, uh, he and Ruby D, uh, the late great, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you yourself were pretty much an innovator in everything that you did. Um, being one of the first black women to just stand in all her blackness and say, hey, this is me. You know, I think that if not the first, you were one of the first, uh, but definitely a representation on film um, and in comedy as well, you know. So you really are uh, a trailblazer in your own right. And I think people really need to understand that. Oh, say that again, Mr. Holly. Say that again. <laughs> it, it, it's my comedy gives me uh, the breath and gives me the release sometimes and the relief that I need. It's a challenge for all of us. Let me just say that. It's a challenge being born Black, being born uh, uh, female, being born male. But if you have this what I call this birthmark, you're going to have challenges no matter what. For me, it was a very specific choice and decision because of how I was treated 
in the world, how people treated this little chocolate girl, and what was so wrong about being black or being dark skinned, so or being chocolate. I now say richly melanated. There you Don't go. <laughs> so it was really, if a picture is truly worth a thousand words, then I wanted to be able to say something and make a statement every time I was seen, whether I spoke a word or not. So I began to wear Afrocentric clothing back in the day before Wakanda. Hello, I was Wakanda before That's right. was Wakanda. <laughs> okay, let's keep it one thousand. Right. <laughs> okay, you know, for that. I chose that. It was not people say, Oh, I love your costume. I would say, No, these are my garments, these are my clothing. But That's I want right. I realized at some point that I made a decision, especially in comedy. Now, if, if I'm doing a film and uh, there's a wardrobe director, a designer, obviously I have to adhere to what the wardrobe was and their right. decisions. I was fortunate enough because I had learned how to articulate, how to express my desire. There's one particular scene uh, that will mean nothing to anybody, but for me it was a personal triumph. Um, I was in um, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Die Hard, okay. with, Die Hard with a Vengeance. And I, it was a cameo. I had literally two scenes there were not a lot of women of color in that but there were two there were two of us one of them had one had more speaking lines than i but it was uh i was the dispatcher okay. and uh i come up uh 911 what you know and all the calls and i come up yeah and i'm gonna marry donald trump my favorite line <laughs> oh, 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 okay uh so but what happened was i don't show my legs not unless I'm in the bedroom or the okay. beach. Even if I'm on the beach, I have a sarong if it's just, unless it's just me and my husband, right? Right. So what I had to decide, I knew that they would try to say I was difficult if I went to the costume designer. So what I did, because I was a child of production and knew that if I can have a, on a human and one-on-one -on -one conversation with the DP, and so I just went to him very gently and said, sir, if you would not mind, when I'm making my entrance, when you're doing that tracking shot, if you could just not show my derriere, my legs, I'd greatly appreciate it. And he respected that because mm -hmm. of how I went to him. Because I understood right. that ultimately, as long as he's getting the shot that the director wants, it doesn't matter that right. you don't show my butt. Or you don't. But I also <laughs> understood that there was a nation, there was a, a community of people who took ownership in how I represented myself, that the community was looking at me. So for me, it was important to hold true to what I had decided, that if they were going to try to make jokes about me, if they were going to try to make me the brunt of the joke, then they were going to have to try very hard because the Empress was on her throne. There you go. There you go. <laughs> And you know what? I'm I'm glad that you said um, it was how you brought it to the the, the DP um, because a lot of people don't understand it's not what you do it's about how you do it, and a lot of people respected you. Um, you know, even me not knowing you, I know you through your work, of course, but me not knowing you personally, I respect everything that you did because of the way that you did it. You know, you never had to go out of your way to to be this or to be that. You just said, hey. This is what I'm offering. Take it or leave it. This and I respected that. I'm Felix and Bell's oldest baby girl. I am proud. I am proud to be black because I had to fight to understand what it meant. It took me so long to fight to understand what it meant. It's not, it, we're not revered in history books. We were not. When I was growing up, when I discovered black history through Donna P. Johnson at Southeast Senior High in Kansas City, Missouri, it changed my world. It validated me. There was things that people were talking about. So I took that information about our history and we were more than slaves. What about our history before slavery? And so right. I found out that we had a we had a legacy that had nothing to do or had more to do with who we were than slavery. So I connected to that truth. I connected to that history. When we were we were Moors, we were Black Moors, when we really ruled the seven seas. I remember even as a child when I was watching Alibaba and the Seven Thieves and all those little things <laughs> on Sunday, you know, on Sunday we had our movie night and I would be literally sit there in tears because, but what I was thinking, even as a little girl was, she wearing my clothes. 
What's it going to go? When I had the opportunity to dress myself, it was two things. Uh, and one of them is, 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 you know, we talk about the Me Too movement. It, well, let's Me Too, because before right. Me Too, it was Me Too, okay? Exactly, and that was exactly. Part of the for so long. So I need Hollywood execs and folks to stop being, oh, don't clutch your pearls. You know, that's how you were living for years. We were not a part of it. We were not behind the gates. We were not in the bungalow. So we didn't have access to the full information, if you will. But right. we can't, you know, so we too been there for a minute. And so for me, it was a decision also uh, because I happen to be, you know, curve. I'm, a, I'm, you know, one of those ladies with a little curve going on. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right, people. Power of the Booty came from, truth, came from real experience, you know, when somebody literally followed me down the street. And I asked them when they came in the lobby of the place that I was having uh, a meal. And I, and mm -hmm. like, I didn't. So finally, I asked them, what made you follow me down the street? And they said, well, you have a hot body. And I had to, mm -hmm. hey, yes, I do. <laughs> but at that time, I was dancing. Dancing was one of my favorite disciplines. And so everything was, toy right and <laughs> So, uh, so I, I said, wow, well, okay. But I didn't want attention because of that. Yeah. Losing my virginity to rape, and that's, I'm not, you know, trying to stay in that space, but that's the truth of my experience and my existence. Right. So I was always, let me say it this way, power of the booty was a liberating moment for me. It wasn't written. Right. A lot of people need to understand when I go on stage to do my comedy, I'm praying to God that you will give me, that the, that the creator will give me, will give me the words. I say, God, my thoughts, my words, my deeds, and my actions. Fill me with the information that you want me to impart to these people tonight. Let me be a blessing as I have been blessed. That's part of my Absolutely. prayer before I go on that stage and then I'm <sighs> flying without a net. That's um, right. I don't want them lusting, you know. I had seen that so much of the comedy when I was coming out, I was there to watch my dear, dear Eddie Murphy. Mm, I love you, but you came out with the B word on the stage. <laughs> then it was freelance bees, everybody. First was Richard Pryor, who could use profanity, quote unquote, but he did it with an embrace. You felt yes. it like it was an embrace. It wasn't a judgment or an indictment, like sometimes I feel. Um, right. uh, he, you felt like we were part of the family, not being, you know, he was, we weren't in the zoo being observed. And sometimes when comedians talk or, or, or use our, our culture or some of uh, parts of our culture, I don't feel that is they are, in, they, they, they feel that they're included in that. It's, it's mm -hmm. so, um, but I was there the night at the Paramount Theater, my brother Eric and I, when I heard Mr. Murphy talk about the Bush, Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? <laughs> We's in trouble now. <laughs> and that night changed everything. Comedians then wanted to aspire to be like Eddie. He was more in their age group. He was more accessible. Richard was a little bit beyond their age and their years. And they didn't see the importance of not changing it so much. So for me, I said, okay, I'm not going to be your B, number one. Right. You ain't looking in the mirror, I tell him. You ain't looking in the mirror. I had to come up with all these little quick quips and things and what to say to stop them and arrest them at the door so they wouldn't try to come further. Don't try to undress me. Don't try to talk underneath my clothes. So the way I'm dressing right now, bruh, or sister, <laughs> will let you know how to approach. Right. And, and you, you hit it dead on the head. That's exactly we'll right. you know how to approach. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was a decision, and I'm, right. glad I'm glad I made it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think now today, that's one of the things that you're mainly known for. Even if somebody don't know your name, they definitely know your look. So you, you definitely <laughs> look. See, <laughs> oh, yes. you definitely made your mark um, doing something positive. And I think that's a, a lot more than a lot of people can say because you know. When you leave this industry or when you're gone, a lot of people can't say, oh, she was such a positive person or she was a good person in this or she was, she, she represented herself well in this. So, I just want you to know. say something about on whose shoulders we stand. And yeah. I have to give respect and, 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 and honor to 
Rosalind Cash Obaye, an ancestor, because she had locks. But the first woman to have locks on national television was a sister named Juanita Mahone, and she's now Juanita Jennings. She married a, a, a fellow Arkansan uh, named Brent Jennings, and they're both in mm -hmm. the opera. But she was on soap operas with okay. locks, right? A lot of people don't remember because time passed on and we went on, but it was something that I decided that I was going to do. It was an accident. I didn't mean to have locks. It was, but you know how <laughs> our hair is. Right, right. Okay, and I had been wearing two strand twist, but I danced, as I said earlier, so I was in dance three to five times a week. So I kept it in the twist. And mm -hmm. usually I would take it out and my sister-in-law would, you know, comb it out, wash it and put it back. But she was away. So I remember I had a call to do a uh, uh, video soul with Donnie. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I was sitting in for Sherry Corda, I read. <laughs> I knew my hair was as my Grammy, Grammy would say, yo, scalp the Saba, baby. <laughs> I didn't want no Saba scalp sitting up the dog, sitting up the Donnie. So I had to get it done. And I remember that my friend Shaw, God bless her, who had locks at the time, said, oh, girl, come on, I can do your hair. And I said yes, not thinking that I needed to tell her. When you take those two strands out, baby, comb through it. Before right. You, under the shampoo bow. You right. already know that. <laughs> it was already fine to lock anyway. <laughs> curly, curly, curly hair. Right. And when I came out of that shampoo bow, I had thumbs. I had all the, so I literally went through and separated and that's how my lock started. But for years, for the first year, I kept wrapped head hats, funky, whatever, because yeah. I, was, I wasn't ready. I wasn't <laughs> ready, but I had grown my hair to shoulder length, so I didn't want to cut it. So I decided in that moment that I was going to show Black women specifically how to have locks beautifully. Mm. The mats and some of that stuff was looking real special. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, but stuff. you... You you did it you did it well though because you know and it, when you said that it reminded me of the scene and what's love got to do with it um you know when when Tina go in for the coloring and it don't work out right <laughs> but and see that my, that was my natural hair that was my real hair in the movie point being I had to fight with hair to wear my natural hair they wanted to straighten it and I said no all black women didn't straighten their hair just let right. me show you what we can do so I did my French twist and all my look shapes and stuff, but they allowed me, Ann Worthington, God rest her soul, she's an ancestor. I had to fight that black sister to do <laughs> the British point to straighten. I said, baby, no, we don't have to. We don't have the perm, we don't have the wig. We don't have nothing. I got hair. I got real hair. I got good hair. <laughs> right. <laughs> with my good hair, girl. And she worked <laughs> with my good hair. And now those are iconic moments for me as well as others who, you know, so I'm just grateful that, uh, you know, I tell people I didn't know I was uh, a part of history. I was just trying to survive. I didn't know I was writing or living history. I didn't. I'm when I met Ruby D and Ozzy Davis. That I thought that was it. You know, boom. That's it. Exactly. Was, exactly. Pinnacle apex. <laughs> where can I go? Come on. They were like the patron saints of our theater, uh, New yeah. Heritage Theater, uh, where I started, and it was a tutelage in Harlem, a beautiful theater uh, that I was blessed to come through. And Lou Myers was one of the people that came through that theater. Oh uh, yeah. Yes, you know, some of the greats actually came to that stage. It was under the tutelage of Roger Furman. He's now an ancestor, but he in Harlem made amazing theater, produced amazing theater that you couldn't get downtown. So we kind of, you know, we had an attitude, yeah, okay, we might be in Harlem, which was not in Bogue, <laughs> but we did real theater. He yeah. uh, had worked with Diana Sands and that was his muse. Um, and so one day, with tears in his eyes, I remember he said, and I said, what's wrong, Roger? And he said, you just remind me of Diana. Diana, so there were moments I think about Bea Richards. I met Bea Richards because of that. These were black women that I saw. Uh, Ruby D had a pride and, and she shared things with me uh, uh, about how we were, you know, we were royalty, she said. She said, oh, we, yeah. we don't dress up. She said, they expect right. to see us. So when you present yourself, you present yourself as one. Right. So 
I, you know, you don't, I don't take it lightly that she spoke into my life. I don't take it lightly that Maya, Dr. Maya, I call her Mother Maya. I call yeah. her Mother Maya in my own secret heart. Uh, you know, because when she looked at me and said, you have no idea, you're a masterpiece in the making. I'm like, huh? You know, <laughs> I, I think about things now, the humbling, the fact that I, thank God, I never thought I was all that. Mm -hmm. You know, that nobody, I'm, I have arrived, and I'm all, and I, I yeah. Okay, no, no, I was like, what? They even know I'm on the planet? Dick Gregory right. knows I'm on the planet? What? What? Right. What did I do? So exactly. it made me more committed and more concerned about how I used my talent and art. Mm. Because I owed somebody. I owed right. them. I owed them and I owed my mama and my daddy and my granny and my great great granny and all those ancestors who didn't have the opportunity that I had. That's right. So, on whose right. shows I stand, you know, every day. That's what makes me uh, happy to be here. You know, that somebody, Tony Holly, I'm like, okay, yeah, ooh, somebody. Talk to me. <laughs> yes, so, because it's important for people to hear these kind of stories and hear this kind of history. Um, and, and even speaking about history and stories, um, let's talk about uh, 1989, I think it was, uh, Women of Brewster Place. Oh, wow. Um, oh. You were around uh, uh, all star cast of people yeah. from Oprah to Cicely Tyson to Robin Givens and, and, and so many more. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Um, I know that was one of, kind of one of your first uh, big roles. Um, so, what was that experience like for you? That experience was. It's still surreal, you know, even, even though I do and I've done, I'm never, I'm still in awe of, yes. of, of, of how God and, and the ancestors, you know, plotted this thing out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I knew Jack A. She was the only one that I knew prior to doing the, the filming. Uh, and I think what's equally important to me, I tell people the backstory is sometimes more important than, or more interesting than just making the movie, the backstory. How right. I got the role was the piece for me because at that time I was coming from a uh, different world. And mm -hmm. different world was, was supposed to be my pow pow, but mm, <laughs> eh, eh, ah. We can't manipulate this little black girl. She just ain't gonna get up there and do whatever we say do. And I'm right. Like, Especially because I went dressed as an, and they were making me the brother, the joke. They were, you know, I was the third roommate. It was initially Lisa Bonet, Phyllis Dickney, and Marissa Tomei. But because mm -hmm. I wouldn't boom, and I can tell the truth now, y'all, because I wouldn't <laughs> roll my eyes and do all that, and coon, they decided to offer it to someone else. But because of my personality, they wrote me into different world as Phyllis. Isn't that original? Hmm. What were they got hmm. like? So I was actually written in after I wouldn't buffoon, but they wanted my energy in the show. Well, so fast forward to when the Brewster place was, the, the, a woman told me I couldn't act. She humiliated me in, in a live taping. I won't get into that right now. Okay. <laughs> My calm is in my calm. I talk about, oh, they behind. Ah, where you at now? Where you at now? But uh, you know, she had her assistant with the wine bottle following her. So we know what her state was on a regular basis. But she decided uh -huh. she was going to humiliate me in front of the live audience. And I, none of my Harlem, you know, my Harlem family was like, yo, I know you, girl. I know you. No, but I was like, nah, 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 <laughs> I know where I am. Oh, no, this, this is supposed to shut me down. But it won't. And so when I talked to Reuben Cannon, who I had met in a really, really bizarre situation where I went to a casting that was all these children, but Spirit had told me to go. And when Olaia, the casting, saw me, she had a role for me to audition for. So fast forward to Reuben Cannon, casting for Women in the Brewster Place. Big deal. Biggest deal. I didn't have mm -hmm. an agent. I didn't have an agent. So how am I going to get into this audition? Well, I had a first meeting with Reuben based on that. Olaia audition where I just showed up and right. he never forgot me. So I get a call, I go in. I get a call from Mr. Cannon who says, Phyllis, we need your agent because they want to offer you the role. We can't offer it to you. And I'm like, 
So I have a funnier story that I created my own agent, but I'm make, I'm doing I'm writing a one woman show. Her name was Bonnie Rosenthal, darling, don't you love her? So listen, darling, she makes the call. She does what she has to do. It's fabulous, and we get the show. However, it was panic for me. Um, um, but 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 Bruce Bruce replaced was uh, Oprah. Um, it was it was Robin Givens. It yeah. was. It was Donna Dorch, our director. It was Paula Kelly, God bless her. It was Lynette, mm -hmm. that's one of the most beautiful souls. Uh, um, it was just, it was, I was literally, literally, I would sometimes find myself doing like this. <laughs> I know I look like a big old groupie, cause sometimes I would just be, cause the interaction, you know, the interactions of the people. Uh, Lorenz Tate, that's where yeah. I met the Lorenz. Lorenz has been my baby forever. So when, so the backstory for me, the funniest thing of it was some of the things that happened with Robin and, and, and Mr. Tyson, some of the things that happened in the, in the makeup room uh, that were hilarious. Uh, uh, but for me, it was the day that Ruben Cannon called me and said, well, I want to tell you something. He said, I got a call today from, from, uh, one of our favorite actors and he told me her name and she told him that she was interested in the women of Brewster Place but she was only interested in one role and the role was Coralie mm. and I said I had to tell her oh that role's been cast Alfred oh wow it's Alfred Wood has been cast by Phyllis Stickney. And so when he told me that, I mean, I just, you know, part of me just right. because she's amazing. She is amazing yeah. in everything she does. Uh, I love her. Every time I see her, she always recognizes and gives me love back. Um, yeah. uh, and because they, they don't always and that and we need, to work, on, we need to work on that. Women, I'm talking to y'all, whoever's watching, listening, tuning in, stop it. Show each other mm -hmm. love. You got to you don't see if if you don't see me in the store in the mall at the glass station. If you don't see me <laughs> when it's time and you need to be seen, baby, somebody ain't gonna see you. Okay, there so, you go. See each other. See hi. Okay, don't pass a black person on the street in the grocery store in the car. Stop. Do y'all see yeah. what time it is up here? Hmm. So. That uh, it was it was it was a, it was a camaraderie. Another beautiful story was if you remember when the film starts, there is a portrait of each of the characters, right? Right. There was a woman, an artist who was known as a sculptor named Artist Lane. This is probably okay. an about trope. I'm trying to tell it without crying, but anyway, um, <laughs> her name is Artist Lane. And one of the moments that I had that I remember was weird for me on the set was I would hear. Uh, them coming into the dressing room and to the trailer uh, and telling the ladies, uh, Miss So and So, uh, Miss uh, Miss Harry, uh, you you have a, a sitting with with artists today at five. And I wasn't, I never got a call to sit, and I was so hump, you know, like I don't want to blow. I'm here. I don't want to blow. <laughs> so, I, everybody in New York know I'm bad. Y'all don't know here yet, but y'all gonna find out in a second. But I'm be cool, right? That's like, right, that right. They find out. New York, I'm bad. But here I gotta be cool, right? So, <laughs> Not yet, not yet. They don't. They gotta see it. So, but I was, I was really hurt. I was, I was genuinely hurt. I said, "Wow, I'm being excluded because Jack A. and uh, Oprah had a had a particular friendship." And uh, Oprah used to always say, "Thank you to me, Miles." The word "thank you" because some people needed more than I needed more yeah. attention. And uh, and sometimes when I would come in the room, they didn't want me to be getting the attention. And I would always, I, I learned to share the space. Uh, and so um, this particular, we we wrapped the we wrapped we were finished shooting, um, we were heading home, pre, pre, post production, getting checks and doing all the you know ending of the production, and I get a call and they said, uh, Artist Lane wants to speak with you, mm -hmm. and I said okay yeah yeah, and so. I called her and she said, could you come to the studio? I want to talk to you. And I said, yes, ma'am. And so I went to Artist Lane Studio in California. 
And when I went into the studio, there were two um, easels and there were two portraits draped or two art pieces of art draped. And when she unveiled them, one was the picture of Robin Givens or the painting of Robin Givens, Coralie holding her baby with the dead mm -hmm. end. Whenever you look at the women of Brewster Place, it's this picture that they fade in and out of at the start and end of the episode. And the other she unveiled was a portrait of me. Ooh. I'll get it and show it to you. Okay. Oh, wow. That is that, beautiful. That's the picture that's on the movies, yes. that, that on the film, right? But I had no idea. So I'm sitting there now, and I'm totally blown. I'm, I'm looking at the picture. I'm looking at me. I'm looking what? at the portrait of Coralie. And I looked at her. I said, but, 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 I, but, but I didn't sit for you. But I didn't sit for you, Miss Lane. She said, you were the only one I didn't have to. Mm. Uh, they sent me videos of each of your work. She said, and I knew who you were in the first 10 seconds because you were so clean. And I said, oh, but how much are they? And she told me the prices. She said, but I'm going to work with you to afford them. Mm. And so none of my children live, but these are my babies, you know? That's right. Those are the stories and those are the moments that make me know that whatever God has for me to do or whatever I was meant to do, I'm doing it. Oh, I'm, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm it's making, amazing that you, you still have that kind of stuff. And I can tell that you hold it near and dear to your heart. Um, just because a lot of people, when you talk to them now, you say, well, where? They say, oh, I don't know where that stuff is at. But oh, you I had, take pride in yours. I had a storage in there. Was, you know, uh, my storage was stole, sold uh, in May. And, and, and I didn't have, so much was going on in my life. I just lost my mom. There was just a lot going on. And we know now that they probably went through my storage and saw who I, what I had. Right. And they changed the dates of the sale. And so when I went to say, okay, well, here's my stuff. I want to get, get in and move it. They were like, oh, it's gone. It's auction. So I have to say that my trophies and my artwork, I had an art collection. I've learned a different kind of value. That was just me. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Little sneeze. <laughs> Bless you. I thought she teased me because I'm like, eh! But that one was <laughs> fine. They would say, that's a sneeze. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, these are valuable. Um, they're valuable because of what they meant to the person. You know, every time I look at that, it brings back so many memories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So many memories. So many good memories. Um, uh, it was a good time. It validated me. When you ask, what did that mean to me? It validated me. So that lady with the wine glass that was with an assistant that was talking about, I was not a good actress. Oh, you're, uh, it was like, check, make, boo-boo. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Because, you know, it, 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 in telling that story, I'm, I'm glad that you did tell that story, in fact, because sometimes we think that people are counting us out when, in fact, we're, we're being chosen first, you know, in, in a sense. And sometimes we think, well, why not me? Well, why, you know, and just like you said, you got anxious because you didn't get a call, but look what happened. But I didn't, but, um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't clown. And I say that because it was like, this is why I'm coming. And I say coming back. I, I, I didn't, I didn't, and I didn't plan to go anywhere at all. Um, I had a crazy personal situation and um, I couldn't get away from them. They were, they, they were stalking and it was uncomfortable. 
um, and they were a very powerful person, so it was impossible to get away from them if they wanted to find me. So I mm -hmm. did a whole lot of hiding, thinking that, okay, I'll be back in a minute. And then internet came. Yeah. Then reality TV came. <laughs> and then quality and <laughs> class Content and all kinds of training. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you twerk, baby? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you twerk? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I was like, no, but I'm a wonderful. I'm, a, I'm talent. I have a breath. I can bring whatever. I can rock. But can you twerk? Right. Uh, oh no, no. Here's the question: How many followers do you have? There you go. So speaking of which, they follow me, 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 follow me. IG, Phyllis Yvonne Stickney, Twitter, Phyllis Stickney, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, you're right. It changed. And I was, I was, um, so it was it was a catch-22. Some people didn't want to have me around because they thought I was too clean or too, you know, um, like I wasn't human. I said, no, I wasn't always um, clear. Right. I don't, I don't judge you if you still want to, you know, hey, I like mm -hmm. a little, uh, you know, little Cruzon raspberry rum <laughs> with some uh, San Pellegrino or blood orange and, and pomegranate soda mix. That's that right. <laughs> Overindulgence is the sin, people. Get it clear. Mm -hmm. so, but but it became my comedy was so quote unquote clean, which I prided myself in not using profanity. Yeah. I never used the you know I said I'm not gonna talk about my p or your d. It ain't that funny or entertaining. Okay, so if that's mm -hmm. what you can hear about, I'm gonna give you a few minutes. You can you can leave the room. I won't be mad. And that's how <laughs> I had to start it because I knew, like I said in the beginning, I want to go somewhere. I didn't want right. to just be that girl that that came to the barbecues and, and just, no, I didn't want to be her. And because I made those choices, I've been able to go to Senegal as an artist. I've been able to go to a, a, other countries in the world as an artist because mm -hmm. they knew that it was going to be class. Absolutely. Be intelligent and it was going to be culturally sensitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I'll say this. Um, as far as your work is concerned, you have made it so that, you know, when, when people see you in a role, they really, well, I can really tell that you studied your craft because Phyllis Yvonne Stickney as a character in Women of Brewster Place or, or, or Malcolm X or What's Love Got to Do With It is nothing like the Phyllis Yvonne Stickney on stage or, you know, it, it, it's, it's different people because you actually studied your craft, I can tell, and you step into those roles and you really care about what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I think that's what people really mostly connected to when you step on that screen, you know? And, and a lot of people see this is a beautiful black chocolate woman who is standing in all of her chocolateness, like you like to say, <laughs> and, and truly owning this role, whatever it may be, uh, even with, New Jack City, which is one of my favorites, you know, like it, it, it's it's a classic, of course. Wow! And no matter what scene you're in, it's 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 hilarious. Well, I won't say it's hilarious, but it is hilarious in a way. But <laughs> even the court scene when you call Nino Brown out and he he comes back and says, "Miss Hawkins." Right, I'm sure know, the courtroom is entertained by your socio socio political tirade, Mr. Brown. Society at large <laughs> is not on trial here. You are. You are. That's yeah. right. Were you or were you not head of the murderously bloody CMB? <laughs> yeah. That's right. But you That's know, right. I told you the backstory. I was supposed to be playing Chris Rock's role. Holla. You weren't going to no. know I was a girl until, you weren't going to know I was a female until I fell off the bike. Holla. But how wow. did I get this film? Hold up. Let me tell you about that part right there. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. What? I had been in 
Hollywood with George Jackson, God rest his soul, and Doug McHenry, the two producers. And we had been working on the script. You know, when I say working, we've been talking about it and tooling and who's going to be in it. And they were like, okay, Pookie, that's right. you. Right? Because I, I was, I needed my breakout role. That was it. I needed right. people to see one time in a role where I got more than four lines, right? Right. So, <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Next thing I know, the film I'm being produced, my nigga, but, huh? but see, I'm Felix and Belle's oldest baby girl, okay? Mm-hmm. Understand that, I mean, I live in Harlem, I mean, mm-hmm. the world. So, uh, Rob, when I heard that they was on 145th Street, were, like three blocks from me, doing a <laughs> That I, uh, I didn't get a call for. Uh, oh no, 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 no! So me and my brother, my youngest brother Eric, I said, "Come on, Eric, go with me." We marched down to the set. Preston Holmes, who I love, 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 amazing man. The first, uh, I think, was uh, on the Academy of um, what is it called? Nominating or voting committee. Uh, yes. He's an amazing yes. producer, uh, Preston Holmes. Anyway. Preston, I walk up and they're sitting on the stoop of this building and I got me and my brother and my little crew because, you know, in Harlem, before, before they came, that was, I, what, that's me. So, <laughs> <laughs> I rolled up to Mr. Holmes and I was like, uh, excuse me, uh, I know y'all not doing a film, not this film, and I'm not in it. Where's, what's my role? <laughs> Them knowing me like they do. He heard him say, go to two, go to two, George Jackson, go to two, <laughs> go to two. Philly Siobhan Stickney is on the set. Miss Stickney is on set. She has a question for you. What role did I get, baby? Hmm. I was like, oh no, y'all not doing that. This not, no, 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 that's not, no. That, that's what's not gonna happen, all right? <laughs> that, that ain't what's not. So Miss Hawkins, that's how I got the role of Miss Hawkins. Wow. I'm going to be up in this film because if I can't be Pookie, uh, guess what? Hmm. You better find somebody as a stop. <laughs> find something. <laughs> so now, you know, then I have to be a little quieter. Now I don't, I don't have to. I have a birthday coming up. I have a milestone year, October 1st. I am. Oh, well, uh, well congrats. Oh, well, happy birthday, uh, fellow Libra. I'm on the 6th. Oh. So. <laughs> Yep, I'm on the Stop I'm it. Sorry. That is Jackie's birthday. Shut up. <laughs> I love it. So we know why. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you, what, you, what you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> you can't duplicate it. Uh, 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 you can't imitate it. Uh, 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 you can't be that. Uh, uh, you can't be that. Uh, uh, you want to see me? Uh, uh, I don't hate. Mm, I don't hate. <laughs> me, baby. Me. If I don't right. like me, if you don't like you, ain't nobody going to like you. At all. At, At all. all. People will be like, well, why is she so happy? She's too black to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's ain't no such thing. Like, they would look at me like, they know. Why is she so happy? Don't she know she's black? <laughs> but you know that that spirit radiates off of you and it jumps on other people you know because somebody could be having a bad day I promise if they come around you I, I, I guarantee you they might be doing backflips when they leave sis, 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 you already know I, I, used to tell people, I'm no, I was a morale booster they would walk yes. me on the floor and tell you, you ain't gonna do nothing but have a good time and make some money mess with me that's all you gonna do what the exactly problem? Oh my God! Exactly. Well, again, because I won't go to <laughs> you. That's what you want. Let me get you that. I can get you that. I can hook that up for you. But Susie that's ain't right. in the equation. Not this Susie. Somebody, I can get you. A <laughs> we can hook it up. So mm. like, I was like, no, because this ain't no. We not no 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 right. no 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 right. no. So I didn't get a lot of comedy stages because I wasn't gonna be the girl in the. I wasn't gonna be that. I wasn't gonna be that. I wasn't gonna be that on the set. Talk about stuff. What's love got to do with it? The uh-huh. director bumped heads because on that moment where he was like, "At Philly, I, I'm, of course, costume is Phyllis here in Orlando." 
he said was Phyllis period. Was she dressed period all under, which means is she dressing in 50s underwear? Why is that of important? Because you want to see, right. right? See, this Felix and Bells, oh, I've already thought past you. Listen, I'm already there, dude. I'm already there, dude. Come I'm on now. Come and you on are now. that too, because I already know what's getting ready to happen. See, but you're not used to thinking, you're not used to dealing with a real, a real empress. You've been dealing with these the fake wannabe think they as in training to, to uh uh-uh, uh no. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like God done talking to me for real. No, no, no. There you go. So, while he was doing all that, it's finished period all on that issue. And I already don't like you because I see how you're trying to holler at Miss uh, 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 Bassett and she's trying to stay focused on her role and you all right. actuated and let her do her work, doggone it. Let her just do her work. But no, you made the mistake of trying to come for me. No, mm. He made the he mistake. Know. Yes, he did. <laughs> oh, it's Phyllis Perry, go under. Is she? So he I didn't said, know. Oh, Brian, I said, I said uh, uh, Brian, well, Brian, what are you trying to, what are you trying to achieve? That was my question. Brian, right. what are you trying to achieve? He said, well, I want to establish that, that, that Eileen is on her way um, um, to the club, that she's getting dressed for the club. I said, well, I've got that for you. I, I, I've got it for you. Because I knew mm. two things as a professional. Number one, you have not negotiated in my contract for me to be in my underwear. It's extra yeah. pay. Number two, that's my decision. You just want to see under my clothes because I hear your conversation all day long talking to these other people under their dresses. You're not doing that with me. Mm-hmm. I said, I've got something. I've got a solution for you, mister. I've got a solution for you, Mr. Wills. No, not a problem. Got it. Hmm. I said yes, because now we you good about to go to meal penalty. That coming that producer in that coming that producer because uh-huh. we gonna go into uh-huh. meal penalty. Yeah, right. Because now I got the what? I got to go to wardrobe. I got to let them see my undies. They got to do, now. I got to do a parade, which means I'm gonna be walking around in my underwear for all you men. That's not gonna happen, dude. You mm-hmm. don't understand who you're dealing with. Who you just <laughs> don't? Who just stop it. <laughs> So now, when you see the film again, it will have a different meaning. When you see Aileen in the background in her blue dress do this. Zip. That's right. It, it, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Don't that tell you I'm putting on my clothes when I zip it? That's right. No underwear, neither. Press on, and I don't mean that. <laughs> That's right. That's so right. Just, so I, I'm like, I pay dues. My dues are paid dues. So when I see some of these young babies, who are just so willing to give themselves, give their souls, not understanding what the real price is, because um, mm. you don't ever get that back. You can't That's ever right. get your respectability back. You can never take that back. And so I, I, I have mourned enough to be able to say, okay, God said, it's time to get back in. When I heard myself about four years ago starting saying on a regular, I was born for times such as these. And it was always yeah. some young person under 30 or under 40 that I was talking to and just trying to get them to understand, baby, we got to connect in a different kind of way. And entertainment is much more powerful and much more meaningful than you would ever understand. But you need to know that you don't need to allow yourself to be used as a pawn in a diabolical, evil, wicked game. And mm. you can win in this game, but you just got to know the rules and how to play. You That's don't right. have to go. It's different rooms you can go into. Hmm. It's different rooms you can go into. That's now, right. Who do you want to go in? Hmm. I went into the longevity room myself. Oh, <laughs> oh come on now. Come on now. I want to be in this piece for a while. I'm like, I want to roll out. <laughs> I want to do this. Come on. That's my, what? That's my inspiration. 91, yeah. fabulous. That's when, when she says to me, Phyllis, where, we need you back on the stage. We need to see you on the screen. I'm listening, Mama. I'm listening. Yeah. It's the last, one of the last things she said to me, you know, we saw each other at the Sugar Bar, Nick and Val's uh, place in, in New York. And, oh, yeah. Uh, so I had a, had a year uh, engagement there every once a month. And she would come and hang out. And she looked one day and told me, you need to get back on the stage and screen. We need to see you there. Yes, ma'am. So I'm, That's right. I'm working on. That's right. <laughs> you know, but I, I'm glad. Um, you know, 
you, you are now stepping back into what's yours. Um, rightfully so, because like I said, every everything that you've done thus far, you have truly made your mark in. Um, and, and there's nothing you can't do from, uh, really, what, what do you not do, though? I, I, this is what I need to know, because you're doing acting, comedy, you're doing behind the scenes. You do, What do you not do? I do my clothes. That's the part I really want to do. I really want to get my clothing line out there. And I know yeah. somebody out there is ready to work with me, because I just know now, there's a lot of stuff I had to get out of the way and get out of my own way, because I was also so concerned about the opinion of others. And that okay. had me stagnant. I didn't know how to move because the, the word or the, the thoughts or the rumors and it was just a lot. And I'm not perfect. I have made mistakes, in it, but I have repented. I mm -hmm. have prayed. I have repented. So what I did when I was in my crazy moment, I call it a crazy moment because mm -hmm. I was in a lot of pain and uh, there were things that I would have never thought. And I was like, wow. Oh, how do I get here? Uh-uh, I don't like, I don't like here. Right. So, so you have the right to change your life. Actually, you're the only one can do it. So I, I reconnected with those things, with the values that I had started with in the beginning. Mm. I went back. I always tell people, whenever I get confused or feel like I lose my way or have some questions, I go back to the genesis of things. Why That's did right. I do this? How did I begin this? Is are the same variables then now? Are they still present now? That were present then. What has changed? How's it and, and and if so, then I make a decision to move forward. If the things that I still need to do or need to have or need to see are still such that this needs to happen, then I go on. Or why That's is right. this person in my life? I go back to the genesis of things. And if I and I remember so that I don't get caught up in the moment and blow something in the moment, mm -hmm. being, angry, being frustrated. Um, it's an exercise in humility. And for me, it's been an exercise in patience. One of the hardest things was to see people, I said, mediocrity replacing brilliance. All right, come on now. Come on now. That was hard. Yeah. That was, that's because you said, but, but, oh, can I? And it was just this whole, it was almost if you had talent or you had experience, it, it, that wasn't a good thing because everybody's going to do their own thing. Nobody right. wanted to be accountable. Nobody wanted to have rules. It's like, but no, one of the things that really got to me and I have was when it, everything was a one man, I wrote, direct, start, produce. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can anybody <laughs> else eat, baby? Can anybody else eat, honey? <laughs> it's a collaborative discipline, sweetie. It really is. If you look at anything past five years ago, it was usually a whole team to do what mm -hmm. you do. Your doggone self. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Out of high school. <laughs> oh, <laughs> high school, you say. Oh, that's so sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this, okay. Yeah. And you want me to understudy? Oh. Mm -hmm. I get calls that you would be <laughs> what? Uh, I just want to know if you if you if you could do if you could do this character. I read all four of them for him. Mm -hmm. Different characters. David E. Tapp, but I don't call no names, but his initials is David. <laughs> <Tapp>. <laughs> Back in the day, mm -hmm. half many. But see, they came on, and, and and so what happened was people realized. I, I kept watching Mike Matthews. I was there the first. I tell, tell people I can talk because I was there. I was there That's when right. I had to sneak away from New York because none of my theater actors would ever believe that I was doing what they used to call the Holland plays. Mm -hmm. But it was Holland. <laughs> they weren't projecting. Was they weren't trained. They weren't actors. They didn't have experience. They was they had sold the most tickets in the quad. Come on now. Come on. I, but I went, I did that show because I, as I said to my thespian friends, listen, they've tapped into an audience that we didn't tap into. They tapped mm -hmm. into the church. And so we, so then we call it church theater because it was right. always going to the same characters. 
for what they, so David came to me out of that. And all I asked him was, David, please do your homework before you meet somebody. Right. I said, because I did my homework before I met you, I knew what you'd done, but you walked, I walked in this room, you didn't have an idea of who I was because you would have never asked an actress with my ability, can I do a role? I can do right. anything. I used to say I can do anything but look white and now with special makeup, I can do that. But exactly. <laughs> they have exactly. That I can't do. Yeah. I will do my best. And so one of the things that I hope that happens in this new normal for us, in this post-COVID, I hope that we remain to be kind, those of us who found kindness for each other, not just in the family and people that we like, but the doors were being held open. People were saying good morning and thank you and making eye contact. And there was a different kind of humanness that came on the planet. I felt it and it touched me in a way that I said, okay, I need to remember this and try to savor it and replicate it everywhere I can. Because mm -hmm. we, if we didn't pay attention this time, and not just we as people of color, but we as a nation, race of people, we as planet inhabitants, if we don't get it together, that there is something that love is really, and I don't mean, I tell people, I'm talking about love without an X or a K a in it. Okay. If we don't find that, we're doomed. And we have the opportunity to do it now. We have the opportunity now that this pause button has, has been hit. And right. now the world is seeing what our plight is. That was one of my, I always had a message. My comedy had a message. I didn't want to do things that didn't have a message. I didn't want to do something that my mother, who is now an ancestor, could not go to see it with pride or take her church sisters and the mothers from the church. So I had a responsibility and accountability on my life. And recently I, 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 I accepted my calling, you okay. know, uh, that I've been running from for a long time. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I say running from, I do it, but I, but I just, it wasn't official. Right, know, right. Officialized, you know, but uh, uh, people who've been wanting to ordain. And, and so I agreed. A woman came to me at the Dudley, at a Dudley conference. Her name is Pastor Linda. And this mm -hmm. woman, I didn't know her from a can of paint. She looked at me, she said, oh my God, I've been fasting and praying for you and tears and, and all, and, and I'm a child and I've been praying. She, I knew she didn't know my prayer, so I knew that this was God. This was the most highest answer. I mean, I had been right. praying for a husband, praying for, I said, I need a partner. I, 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 I'm tired of doing this, schlepping and I'm everywhere. I'm by myself, Father God, I need, and I'm praying, praying. This has been about three years now. I'm, I'm in, whoo. So when this woman shows up and she speaks to me, about we're at this conference. I'm there to see Lisa Nichols, who, when she first met me, was in a room with 300 people. Mm. That was a capacity. Lisa Nichols, her first time speaking, she wanted me in the room because I was an inspiration. I share that because what did I do? I said, God, how does she now on the stock market? And I'm sitting here trying to figure things out. What happened? Mm -hmm. That's why I say you got to get out of your own way sometimes. That's right. But in this conference, years later, that I that now Lisa's the keynote speaker in the room full and the books are sold. And and I just want another moment to say, hey Lisa, remember, can we have a moment? But that wasn't why I was there. God had brought me there to meet this pastor, this lady mm -hmm. yeah, who was saying, uh, ma'am, I've been praying and fasting. And she went in on me. I mean, went in. And as she's giving me a word, I know that everything she's saying is from God because I know what my prayers have been. Right. So we go in and we finish in the signing and the order back and the picture and, and I sneak out the side door before people who might recognize, recognize. And she follows out the door and she says, it, it's you. She said, uh, I don't watch television and movies. She said, but one day you came up on my Something she was doing, she said, I, my, I came up on her, on her screen mm -hmm. and Holy Spirit told her to pray for me. She said, it's time for you to step into your purpose. Hmm. Mm -hmm. She said, and I have to help usher you into it because you don't trust a lot of people because of what you've been through. 
but you're here for the young people. You're here to deliver a message that they will listen to from you because of how you live life. So I had been praying that I said, God, if you send me prayer warriors, I'll go back. I'll go back and I'll speak your words and I'll say what I know I have to say that's not gonna be popular because organized has done things that are just not kosher. Right, right. Keep us in line. Mm -hmm. But if we don't get free this time and get back to God, and that's what my work is really all about. Mm -hmm. All the time. Absolutely. 